Hello class, and welcome to week two. This week we're going to talk about malware, we're going to talk about network segmentation, and um, how we manage threats, vulnerabilities, and how we test to make sure that the outcomes that we expect are actually the outcomes that we're getting. So first, let's talk about malware. Malware is an umbrella term that includes all forms of malicious code or malicious software. A virus was the first malware that ever came out. Viruses were unable to spread by themselves, which was okay because networks really weren't as big and spread out as they are now. There wasn't a lot of opportunity for anything that could spread by itself. Required user action. Uh, in those days, you typically would have a virus attached to a file, and that file would be stored on a floppy and it'd be shared with somebody, or it might be stored on a server someplace. Um, and other people would download that file to their systems and become infected. So it couldn't spread itself. It relied on user behavior. Worms, on the other hand, can spread by themselves. Once a worm is down on a system on a network, it all by itself starts going looking for other systems that have vulnerabilities that it can exploit. And when it finds those systems, it moves to those systems. The amount of time it takes for a worm to infect an entire network is very, very small. Trojans are often coupled with rootkits, what we'll talk about here in a second. A Trojan is an application that looks like it's something that you wanted to download. It actually has functionality that you expected, but in the background, it's doing things you really don't want it to do, like collecting user information and sending it back to an attacker. Rootkits are applications that can take your place of a device driver, can fit in between a device driver and the user collecting information that the user is providing, and they hide themselves. They hide themselves from um, anti-malware solutions. They don't show up when you're looking at processes that are running on a system. If you're infected by a rootkit, usually the best thing you can do is to just wipe your hard drive and start over. This is why images are very important in organizations. Instead of just wiping the hard drive, we simply re-image the machine, it clears all the malware, and the user's back up and running in a very short time. Let's talk about VLANs and segmentation. Now, this is a good place to put this conversation because Segmenting your network can also help prevent the spread of worms. Network segmentation divides an internal network into smaller networks. When we first started putting networks in to organizations, they were flat. The one big network that was available to all devices. You plug a device into the network, you could see all the network traffic. It doesn't mean it processed all the network traffic, but the packets flowing over the network were seen by all devices. What we do today is we break the network up into smaller pieces. That's called segmenting the network. And we usually do this with VLANs. A VLAN is a virtual local area network. By doing this, only the devices that are on their own VLAN or on, on the VLAN together can see each other's traffic. We can use access control lists to ensure that traffic from other VLANs does not come into those VLANs. We can take our most sensitive information and the servers that hold that information and put it on a VLAN, on a network segment, and have have um, an additional IPS, an additional firewall, and maybe other controls that help to lock down that VLAN 
And it's when we do that, we have a we tend to call that a security zone. Groups and and then we group the data, like I said, we group data and systems according to their classification and their risk on VLANs. Now this allows the security teams to apply dollars that they have to fight for at budget time to those systems and those VLANs where the highest risk exists. For more information on VLANs, how to set them up, um, how they how they they integrate into the rest of the security architecture, I encourage you to visit the link that's at the bottom of this slide. So this is an example of a, um, a network that's been segmented into VLANs. And as you can see, we have three externally facing security zones. <clears throat> These are nothing more than what we would normally call a DMZ. But each one of these DMZs is its own individual VLAN. VLANs, as you can see here, receive a number. That's called the VLAN tag. VLANs are identified throughout the network by the switches that actually manage the VLANs, because it is the switches that manage our VLANs. Every VLAN is identified by that tag, and when we build access control lists, we use these VLAN tags to determine what traffic from what VLANs can pass into other VLANs. In this particular case, if we look at our internal core switch, we have a VLAN 75 on which resides our database servers. We have a VLAN 90 on which reside our application servers a VLAN 80 where our email is located, and a VLAN 90, which is again is the same VLAN as the application servers where we put our users. To make this simple, our users can access, easily access the application servers, they're on the same VLAN, but the users, we have an access control list set up in the, in the switch so that this, so a user on VLAN 90 cannot access VLAN 75. In other words, a user system cannot send packets directly to any of these database servers. What they have to do is go through the application servers. Then the application servers are able to get to VLAN 75 and access the, um, the uh, database servers. And again, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on this, this graphic. This graphic is from, let's go back a slide. This graphic is from this chapter at this location. So you can go into a lot more detail. This, um, this, this network is built step by step so you can get a really good idea of how this is done and how it works. So let's talk about filtering. We're going to talk about two kinds of filtering. We're going to talk about web filtering and email filtering. In web filtering, we block sites that not only are only needed for business, but we block sites that are potentially high risk or are known to be malicious sites. We can do we do this in a number of ways. First of all, if we want to block sites that where we just don't want our users to go, like let's say social networking sites, we can use a, a, uh, a category of social networks and block that entire category. This is how most filtering solutions work. You can also block individual sites, but that becomes really hard to manage. Web filtering solutions come in three come in really two different kinds you have your your actual filtering solutions which are what open dns and websense are and proxy servers can also among a many other things that a proxy server does can also be used to manage fil to filter web content another other 
devices like Cisco's ASA devices have web filtering built in. In those devices, you have IPS, you have a firewall, you have web filtering, among other things. So web filtering is becoming just a basic, it's becoming a standard capability when employing security controls. What this does is it prevents users from going to places they shouldn't be going to, not necessarily because they intentionally want to go there. So let's say that a phishing email comes in. A user clicks on a link in a phishing email. That link goes to a known malicious site. The web filtering solution will look at that and say, uh-uh, that user can't go there because that site is known to do bad things to user systems. It's blocked. So just even though your user forgot that they're not supposed to click on just anything that comes in, you have technology in place with web filtering to block access to that site because it is known to be bad. Those sites are updated continuously by the vendors so that you, especially OpenDNS, which is owned by Cisco and WebSense, these solutions are updated multiple times during the day so that you're always, your users are always protected against, against sites that are emerging as being dangerous for access. In addition to that, <clears throat> there are certain categories of sites that are high risk. The most high risk sites, again, in 2015, are porn sites. Two things. First of all, you don't want your users going to porn sites because it's inappropriate for business environment. Second thing is, porn sites are just treasure troves of malware. And allowing a user to go there or any user going there is apt to be able is to apt to download something whether they click on anything or not. So you want to keep them away from those things. Um, there are other categories of sites that you really don't want your users going to because of of inappropriateness. For example, hate sites. Uh, another large another category of sites that are um, of high risk are social network sites. And we're going to talk about those in a minute. Doesn't mean you have to block them. An organization may or may not want to block social networking sites. But after we discuss it a little bit here in this lecture, you may see that there's a value in doing that. For more information about OpenDNS and how web filtering works, check the article that's at the link at the bottom of the slide. Email filtering is extremely important. Like we just talked about, email filtering is used for phishing, but it doesn't mean that a user is going to be redirected to a malicious site in order for malware to be installed. Simply clicking on a link might install, or clicking on a on a um, attachment might install something on a system that you really don't want to be there. So there are two approaches to this, and they should both be used. It's actually, instead of two approaches, it's actually two layers of defense. The first one is to filter mail as it comes in the perimeter. You can do this with um, solutions such as Barracuda's email filtering solution. It has malware, anti-malware software in it, and it will uh, scan out any known signatures that it has, it is updated regularly, so that you, it is always has the most current sign malware signatures in it. The other thing that it can do is strip out anything that cannot be scanned. For example, something that's encrypted. A lot of organizations, and I am a big supporter of this, block any encrypted attachments. If I can't scan it, the user can't get it. There are other ways to get information to users, such as secure email services. And so there's the risk of allowing an encrypted attachment to come in and, it work, and, and one that cannot be scanned is just way too high. 
So we block encrypted. We block file types. So there's a whole list of file types that we should be blocking or stripping off of the email. Under the bullet block all high risk attachments on this slide, there's a link. You can go there and it has a full list of everything that an organization should block. Those, none of those attachment types should either be allowed or they should be considered high risk. Now we're going to talk about threat management. In the risk formulas, the, in a standard risk formulas, you have threats, vulnerabilities, and business impact. We're going to talk about how we manage business impact later in the class. In this lecture, we're going to talk about managing the threats and the vulnerabilities. Until recently, we used to, we used to teach that managing threats was not something that had any value. Uh, we had no control over threats. The biggest thing that we should do would be to manage our vulnerabilities and our business impact. Well, recently, in, in the last two or three years, we've moved away from that and started and as, as solutions have come out to help us manage threats. And what threat management allows us to do is to detect a threat as it is in process by using any by using a number of solutions. Now the most the most common solution today is the SIM, which is a security information and event management. And what it does is it allows a comprehensive monitoring and detection of anything that's going on across your network. What we tended to do when we first started and this is just a sophisticated log management uh, solution. What we used to do is we used to look at individual logs on servers, individual logs on switches, individual logs on, on routers and IPS. What it, but it, it doesn't really allow us to get the big picture. We're looking at things that are happening on, on each individual device. And if we're lucky, our, something might flip in our brains and we might, discover, we might decide, hey, you know, there's a problem here. But that doesn't happen very often. We usually have to see something happening on a specific device that has a that that we know is wrong before we start looking any further. Well, with security information and event management, we collect all of the logs from all of the critical systems or systems of interest, and we pull them into a log server. In this case, a syslog server. Syslog is not a brand name. It is a it is a a a format it is a standard for how logs are supposed to be formatted so that they can be shared across all types of systems by all types of vendors. So we take all those logs, we move them into a, and we aggregate them into a syslog server. Once the logs are aggregated, we run them through what's known as a correlation engine. The correlation engine looks for patterns, it looks for patterns across all the logs so that it can see this is happening at points A, B, and D, which, mean, which looks like this kind of attack. It can alert by mail. It can alert by text, by e by, uh, uh, or it can just put it up on the portal that's in front of your, one of your security analysts. If you've outsourced this, usually it's managed 24-7. There's somebody sitting in front of a monitor like this portal 24 hours a day, seven days a week. If you're doing it in-house, it's probably an eight to 10 hour function um, where you have an analyst sitting there having it up on one of their monitors, always with an eye on it to make sure that if something goes, something is not looking right, if red lights start to flash, um, then the analyst can take a closer look to see what's going on. And this is near real time. Uh, with a SIM, you can usually find an attack in process. If the patterns are known, you can find attacks in process pretty well. Now, what this doesn't do a lot of is bring, in, bring together information that's current 
in information from possibly weeks ago, as well as threat intelligence that is being pulled in by all types of sources across the network, across the internet. Now, this was a shortcoming. It didn't allow us to get a really good picture of threats that had been in for a while or had been in and left or had been they who were coming in through new types of attack vectors. So what we're doing now, what we're seeing now, is threat analytics. We're taking the same solutions that businesses are taking to determine how business their business is doing, taking where they accumulate huge amounts of data and they run it through these analytical engines and it comes up with patterns. So we're doing the same thing with security logs and security information. So we take information as generated inside and outside, outside the organization, and we uncover hidden relationships, direct patterns, and, and it allows us to see that the threat there's a threat in process and, and to contain it and eradicate it. We're blending real-time analytics which is what the SIM is, and data in motion, again, that's what the SIM is, with historical data, with historical analysis. So we have analysis that's done before, we save it. We take that analysis and we also, we use that with our real-time analysis. We're comparing and contrasting information continuously, looking for things that are questionable. And threat analytics, and it's called cognitive threat analytics by Cisco, and it's called other things by other organizations. But what this is going to allow us to do, and it may or may not, and for large companies, it will probably re completely replace SIM, or SIM will be integrated into this, is that it'll allow us to do a much better job of, of identifying those patterns and behavior relationships that indicate that we are under attack or are have been under attack recently. So what will be eliminated are things like attacks on target where it took weeks or months to figure out that an attack was in process. We don't we want that to go away. That can't continue to happen. In addition to threat management, we also want to manage our vulnerabilities. Now, this is not, there's nothing new here. We've been managing vulnerabilities ever since security became of concern for IT. The biggest vulnerability management activity is patch management. When a patches are released, we apply them if it's reasonable and appropriate to do so. What this means is that not all patches need to be applied, even if the vendor says they're critical. Just because they're critical overall does not mean they're critical in our environment. Because our controls that we have in place, the segmentation that we have in place, the way that we're managing security across our network may make a vulnerability that's been released a low vulnerability, low risk for us. That doesn't mean we never apply it. What it means is that we put that aside for a, for a week or two while we actually we implement the, the, the patches that are critical to our environment. And it takes a while to put a patch in. You have to test it, make sure it's not going to break anything, and then you roll it out. And rolling it out might take a while, three or four days to get most of most if not all of your systems patched. So we want to make sure we're focusing on the right vulnerabilities. We have the implementation of relevant security baselines. Companies like Microsoft let us know what, how, how to configure different types of servers. What should the security uh, configuration look like for a domain controller? What should it look like for an exchange server? That information is available. 
And so we want to make sure that the procedures we have in place to build servers have, have all the steps necessary to apply security baselines. And we're going to look at, we're going to see here in a minute that there's a, there are tools to test that. We want to be able, we want to do regular vulnerability scans. We want to be scanning systems every month, not necessarily the same systems. We have high, we have high vol, high risk systems and we have low risk systems. You know, the low risk systems, you may only scan once a year, but never any longer than that, always at least once a year. You have other systems you may want to scan once a quarter or once a month, depending on the classification of the data and the risk associated with that data. You also want to do daily vulnerability reviews. So uh, I used to have my on-call analyst uh, go to, to identified sites looking for vulnerabilities that have been reported in the last 24 hours. We need to know if those vulnerabilities are high risk for us. Even if no patches have been released, you still have to know about the vulnerabilities. If patches have not been released, you and the risk assessment, the quick risk assessment you do for that vulnerability show that it's high risk, well then compensating controls are necessary to mitigate that risk. And a compensating control is something that we implement until we can eliminate the vulnerability. It's something that uh, allows us to, to reduce the probability that a threat is actually going to be able to get to that vulnerability and to exploit it. And then, of course, we always eliminate vulnerabilities when, they're, when it's possible and when it's reasonable. Even low-risk vulnerabilities should be patched eventually. Because I tell you, and anyone who's been in IT, any of you who have been in IT for a while know that because that something that's a low risk vulnerability today could end up being a critical vulnerability in six months because someone's found a new way to get to it. So patching all vulnerabilities, as long as you don't break the business, patching all vulnerabilities is absolutely the right thing to do. Vulnerability detection, again, this is, we go back to scanning. The ways that we can identify vulnerabilities are from scans. You got web application scanners, which, which will scan web apps. At, you know, this particular one here, these tools that are listed at this link um, at the uh, Open Web Security Project, Web Application Security Project, uh, are tools that are specifically designed to go into a web application and look for things that are common vulnerabilities that allow attackers to steal data, to compromise web servers, compromise database servers that are connected to those web servers, etc. Now, Nessus is a scanner that's been out there for years and it is used to scan servers and other devices on your network. Um, and you can do it, for example, by IP range. So you want to do, you, you select a VLAN. Say, I want to scan all the devices on this VLAN. Nessus will do that for you in a report back based on all of its updated information about current configuration and patch vulnerabilities. The MBS, MBSA is Microsoft's baseline security analyzer. What it does, and we, I talked about this a little bit in the last slide, what it allows you to do, it's if you're building a device as part of a project and it's about to be put plugged into your production network, before it goes in your production network, run MBSA on it. Security should run MBSA. Your server, your server engineers are going to build the server based on security baselines. The M security team tests it with MBSA to make sure that, that the uh, security baselines have been met. Or because MBSA is updated frequently, making sure that there isn't a vulnerability that Microsoft has found or a configuration change that Microsoft is recommending 
that is not included in the procedures that we've put together for building a, a, a securely configured device. So it's always a good idea. It was always part of the change management process that I managed. Always run MBSA against any device before it is put into production. This also goes for any images that are built for end user devices. Run them, run MBSA against them to make sure that they're securely configured. Vendors will tell you about vulnerabilities in their products, hopefully. Uh, most of them are getting pretty good about this. And then there are the security organizations. Remember I mentioned that I always had my, my on-call analyst going out to sites looking for emerging vulnerabilities. These are two places that they went. One of them is the National Institute for, of Standards and Technologies National Vulnerability Database at the link provided, and the SANS Institute Internet Storm Center. Also, there's a link there for that. It's good emerging threat information as well as information about new vulnerabilities. Now, once all we have all this in place, we're managing our threats, we're managing our vulnerabilities, we're segmenting the network, we're, we're, we're doing things to mitigate or to reduce the probability that a threat can actually do what it wants to do with our, with our information resources. We have to test to make sure that what we think we've done is actually being effective. One of the ways we do that is with ethical hacking. Ethical hacking, also known as penetration testing, is a way that we can go in and test as an attacker would do scanning, do, you know, look for vulnerabilities, uh, do social engineering attacks against our users, try to find and exploit any vulnerabilities that will allow us to get to a target and be able to exploit or to be able to own that target. We use the same tools and techniques that are used by the attackers. Now, a penetration test should be performed by certified professionals. Not only are they certified, but they should be, they should be highly skilled. They should have a lot of experience in doing this. No penetration test should begin unless it's been documented with a clearly defined scope, management knows what the test is going to be doing, and they sign off on it. Penetration tests are expensive, and penetration testers are expensive to have on the payroll, so we normally outsource penetration tests. The other things that we're looking at here, vulnerability management and threat management, not necessarily outsource penetration testing definitely is something that you should consider outsourcing for your organization. And we only really do penetration testing once a year. Maybe maybe more often if you're, you know, you're you're working and you've got government security concerns that you need to um, you need to be uh, dealing with. But the threat management and the vulnerability management and the risk assessments we do on a regular basis will normally keep us keep us at a norm at a reasonable and appropriate risk level. The, the penetration testing is just one more thing that we do, okay, you know, at least once a year, one more thing that we do to ensure that we're doing the right things and haven't missed anything. Another thing that we do to ensure that we're doing the right stuff is audits. And we're going to talk more about auditing in week five. But audit, the purpose of an audit is to look at the outcomes, not look at all the little details and everything of the procedures and the standards and the guidelines that have all been written and documented, but to look at a policy, determine what the outcome, what management's expected outcomes are of those policies, and then to check to make sure that that's happened. And it's happening, on a, it's happening consistently. That's the purpose of an audit. Audits and penetration tests are different. Audits are not the same as vulnerability management. They're not the same as threat, threat analytics. Audits are looking to determine whether the threat management, the vulnerability management, and, and the 
all the other things that we do every single day are actually achieving the expected outcomes documented in our policies. Other security considerations, social networks. Social networks by themselves are not sources of malware. Not necessarily, especially those like Facebook and Twitter. They're up there. Every once in a while, something happens where, you know, you can, you might be able to, you might click on an ad, for example, and get infected. But most businesses look at these as just productivity wasters. They allow their users to get on there because they want to keep their users happy, but they don't really see them as anything that presents that high of a risk. Well, there are two, two, two things wrong with that. First of all, users can post sensitive information, either intentionally or unintentionally, on social networks. Now, is blocking them at the office going to stop that? Probably not. But it, it, may, it just closes one more door and makes it a little more difficult to do that, especially by accident. But what is what but the big vulnerability here, the big problem with social networks is that attackers are starting to use them to do social networking, social information scraping. In other words, they'll go to someplace like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or LinkedIn. They'll try to befriend a an employee of a target organization and gather information about that employee or or a a a bunch of employees within an industry and then use that to to conduct spear phishing attacks using information about the user's interests about about what the user's job title is that kind of thing using that information to go after that user and that user's coworkers and gaining a foothold either through social engineering or through um, a logical attack. So because we know this, there are things we can do to help prevent the attackers from using the social network information. We can remove local admin access from all of our users, including IT for normal day-to-day -day operations. And we can... Um, and if we don't do that, we can at least make sure that users are not allowed to install any, are, are denied through group policy objects from installing any software on their systems. We should also be scanning all email filtering. We went through email filtering. Email filtering is a wonderful way. And web filtering. These are two great ways to help prevent users who have fallen for a lure from going to the wrong places or prevent the lures from getting to the users in the first place. Cost benefit analysis is something that we do to, in, to ensure that what we're doing, what's reasonable and appropriate for a business. Everything we do, all, all security is based on risk and risk is in the final analysis is all about business impact. So we have probability of occurrence, we have business impact. How probable is it every year on an how how probable is it annually that we're going to experience some business impact? And with that information in hand, we look at controls and how much a control is going to cost us annually to mitigate the risk that we've just defined. So we calculate the business impact. We calculate the cost of mitigating, of mitigating controls. If the annual cost of controls is lower than the annual business impact, then you implement the controls. If the cost of controls is higher than the annual business impact, spend the budget dollars elsewhere, which means you either accept the risk associated with the, risk, with the solution or with the risk assessment you just did, or you avoid it. You can avoid the risk by simply not implementing the solution that the business wants to implement. If it's, ab if it's, if it's necessary, if it has a high value to the business, your avoidance is not going to happen 
Management will simply accept the risk and move on. And then finally, we're going to look at some regulations um, that apply to the United States. We have Sarbanes-Oxley. Sarbanes-Oxley deals with data integrity. It, it's a, it, it is designed to ensure tra transparency in business dealings and to make sure that the financial reports that are published by publicly traded companies, it only applies to publicly traded companies, that the financial reports that are published by publicly traded companies are accurate. The Graham-Leach-Bliley Act applies only to financial institutions, banks and stockbrokers and places like that. It is a privacy organ. It's, it deals specific, primarily with confidentiality, maintaining the privacy of the clients of the financial organization. FISMA deals with the federal government. It is a it is a law that requires the federal federal agencies to meet certain security requirements. HIPAA. HIPAA is about health care. HIPAA covers confidentiality, integrity, and availability of electronic protected health information. It applies to organizations that provide health care or manage health care information. The HIPAA regulation is divided into two rules, the privacy rule and the security rule. The privacy rule is concerned with the release of information, of, of protected health care information. So it deals with when and how to release information. And primarily, it, it is about getting the permission of a patient or a patient's responsible family member before information is released to anyone. It can, it can be as simple as a sign-in sheet into a doctor's office, letting other people know that a person is at that doctor's office. That is technically a HIPAA violation. It can go up to releasing uh, information from a hospital stay. So there's everything in between. It also has to do with only allowing people who are directly involved with patient care to have access to information. And this is, this is in many ways related to the security rule. The security rule has to do with how we provide authentication, authorization, and how we protect the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of protected health care or electronic protected health care information. The confidentiality is related to privacy, ensuring only people authorized to see the data are authorized to see it. And, we, and then when we discuss the, the privacy rule, it, it's also it's important again to, to state that only people directly responsible for the patient's care or managing their insurance, their case, are allowed to see their information. You just can't give blanket access for everyone in a hospital to a patient's medical information. Integrity is about making sure the data is correct. And like any data, this means that only the only people authorized to do so are allowed to make changes to the inf to the patient data. And availability is about making sure that the data is available when and where care providers need to access it. There's, this is self-explanatory. If you can't get to the information, the patient will not receive the care they need. PCI DSS, the payment card industry data security standard, applies to any company that takes payment card, that accepts payment cards. Doesn't matter how big they are or how small they are, it applies. The only difference is that larger organizations that process a certain number of transactions, payment card transactions, are required to be certified by a third party. Small, small organizations like my wife's restaurant 
They do not, but they are required to do self-assessments and to do self-assessments, certain types of assessments, quarterly and annually. Failure to do so can result in a business losing its privileges to accept payment cards. This is a big deal. This is how the payment card, pay, payment card industry sanctions people who don't follow the standard. So it's not a law, but it still has consequences if it's not followed. And that's it for this week. Be sure to read all assigned reading and your, because your success in this class depends on it. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. You can text me, you can call me, and you can also chat with me through the university's uh, chat capabilities. Have a great week.